It's not actually in the gun to the camera, but it is uh, in a bad position for viewers. If the soul is an imitation of the cosmos, then... Well. Well, there's divinity. If it's an imitation, then there's some divineness. It's an imitation of divineness. Second. You're here. Has to be of the senses. Uh, I just want to highlight one sentence before we get into the work at 90D in this text 247. Thomas Taylor as well, and the way of attendance of every part by every man is one, namely to supply each with its own congenial food and motion. And for the divine part, within us, the congenial motions are the intellections and revolutions of the universe. These, each one of us, should follow, rectifying the revolutions within our head, which are distorted by our birth, by learning the harmonies and revolutions of the universe and thereby making the part that thinks like unto the object of its thought in accordance with its original nature. And having achieved its likeness, attained finally to that goal of life which is set before men by the gods as the most good, both for the present and time to come. And we do not agree when we get to Thomas and look at the Greek, there's a big change coming with key words, especially this great line, making the part that thinks like unto the object of its thought. Right? How does Thomas deal with it? Anybody help? Never, can't find it. I take it it's the culture or and besides as such a one always cultivates is that what you want here the intellect that's about where you are and the way of the tendency of the you have the thereby making a part that thinks life unto the object of its thought what is Thomas and Thomas besides, Shaw? and besides, as such a a one always cultivates that which is divine. It seems like. Well, this the, the culture of all the parts is in, indeed entirely one and consists in assigning proper nutrient and motion to us, but the motions which are allied to the divine part of our nature. That seems to be where you were. Would you keep reading? 
are the geodetic energies and circulation of the universe. Yeah, keep going. These, therefore, Louder. each yeah, of us... Okay. Another one? I have... Page. Page uh, 492. Um, that, um, diligently considering the harmonies and circulations oh, down of there. the universe, that the intellective power may become assimilated to the object of intelligence mm -hmm. according to its ancient nature. Got that part, Jim? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, except I was part. reading just above it. Okay, why don't you read the part he just read? Okay, but the motions which are allied to the divine part of our nature are the dionoetic energies and circulations of the universe. These, therefore, each of us ought to pursue, restoring in such a manner those revolutions in our head which have been corrupted by our wanderings about generation through diligent considering the harmonies and circulations of the universe, that the intellective power may become assimilated to the object of intelligence according to its ancient nature. Okay, look here. What difference does it make to change this language? Okay. It's, you would introduce the idea of intellect and intelligence. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he doesn't even say that. Yeah. agree there's a difference between thinking intellect and thought and intelligence. Mm -hmm. That's a very lovely way of putting it, making the part that intellects it like unto the object of its intelligence. How to care. We need a better translation than that. Would you not agree, Gina, we can call on Igmar? Sure. Well, do you mind that? No. Nope. Let me see if we get approval. Done. I just, I happen to have a translation. Making the intellecting part like unto the intelligent. To pardon, do it like Making the intellecting part. Making the intellect. Intellecting part. Because it's an Intellecting, I like that. Yeah. Go ahead. Like unto that which is intellected. Like that. Like unto that which is intellected. Or the intelligible. See, this is much better. See, making the making the making the making the part that is intellecting onto that which is intellected, which is in the object, the intelligible, yeah, the intelligible right. object. See, this is the this is the problem. This, this image, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The eye is seeing what is to be seen. Only here, it's intellect as it's intellecting, it's intellecting what is to be intellected. Okay. Uh, the intellect is the eye of the soul that's capable of seeing the nature of ultimate reality. Right? So that is a seeing, that is the eye of the soul that is seeing itself. Now, what's interesting about this is a couple of words in here. The divine part 
needs something. It needs food and motion. Therefore, he talks about the, di the divine part within us. The congenial motions are intellections and the revolution of the universe. So we're going into the section on the revolutions of the universe. You have to keep this idea in mind to see what he's doing. Right? We want to see what are the motions of the universe because we can use that as a model for the intellect. Is that what he's saying? Come on. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I just wanted to get back where we were and just do one paragraph or so. Um. Okay, let me let me do it this way. Now. <clears throat> the image that we have here. And that's the idea in the mind of God. And so when God focuses his mind on this, you get it. he uses it as a model for the universe. Or the cosmos. When you're talking about it as a model, that's the word paradigm. So he's focusing continuously, continuously, not once and creates, continuously, and then generates the cosmos. Now, we're going to go into this description, how this takes place and the steps and stages of it. What I want you to do, though, is to work backwards and tell me, therefore, since it's a very precise model, you can work backwards, can you not, and tell me, therefore, let us say there are uh, eight things. That are mentioned. As he talks about these eight things about the cosmos. It follows the model of the paradigm, doesn't it? Then you tell me, work backwards and tell me the eight things about the paradigm. Because that's going to be being. As he constructs the universe, the process that he's going to go through, he's going to now talk about the cosmos. And in doing so, we can work backwards and get a picture of the paradigm down. also called being. Capital B. So, he also calls this paradigm the intelligible living creature. as this is, is the living creature. <clears throat> Since we're, we are in the cosmos, you see, therefore we're the means, since we have within us, The power and the method to 
gain an insight and encounter this. Ah. But you know what? This is dynamic. Got motion. So we are supposed to discover the motions and the revolutions. and find their parallel in the soul. And that's what we want to do. <coughs> so, uh, since we have nothing else better to do, might as well do some reading. I'm, I'm missing something. I, I didn't understand. You want to find the motions and revolutions in the paradigm or in the cosmos? I, I misunderstood that. Both. Oh, both. Okay. In the soul. Two for one. It's in the same book. All right. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. I thought. For that living creature, the paradigm, embraces and contains within itself all the intelligible beings, living creatures. Just as this cosmos, the universe, contains us and all other visible living creatures that have been fashioned. Where are you reading, Pierre? I'm on 857. Watch the next sentence. For since God desired to make it resemble most closely that intelligible creature, which is the most beautiful of all, and in all ways most perfect, he constructed it, the living creature, one visible, containing within itself all the living creatures which are by nature akin to itself. Hey, what is that saying? He's going to make it resemble most closely this. Huh? Therefore, there should be a very tight resemblance, most closely, between this idea of the mind of God, called the paradigm of the intelligible living creature, and the whole universe, which he says is like just a living creature. Us, since we have a part of ourselves capable of entering into the intelligible, we're the bridge. So therefore, since he's going to do it and making it most resemble it, then we can get two, can we? Because anytime you know one and one thing resembles another, we can get a description of both and tell the difference between them. Right? That's where we're going. Agree with you? the numbers. He's going through numbers. First, second, third, fourth. Keep all the numbers in line as he proceeds. But first, is the object clear? We not only want to find the resemblance between the two, but if we find the resemblance between the two, then we get an insight into the nature of the idea and the mind of God has created the universe. That's not a bad trip. <laughs> but we also want to know the motions and the revolutions of the universe because that's akin to what's going on within us, which if we can then imitate, that's a yoga. Yeah. That's a yoga. That's what he says anyhow. He may not do it because this is Greek. And as they say, never look a Greek in the mouth. Unless you're a Greek. 
Greek. Right? Or is it a horse? Well, I think it was a Greek. Probably a Greek horse. <laughs> Greek horse, yeah. So, um, um, so you see, there's, um, <clears throat> if we can just read it, then you have to be alert to those features that can apply to both, only one will be more exemplary or more perfect than the other since one is setting to be resembling the other. And therefore, we should get a perfect description of the nature of pure being. Yep. Now, usually we put this up for a vote, but if Myra agrees, we can go on. Sure. Okay. <laughs> okay, need a couple of readers to play? I'll read. Thank you. Are we right? What are we reading? <clears throat> are we right then in describing the heaven Page as number one? 57. 31A. 31A. Yeah. Thank you. Everyone there, hold on for a moment. Are we right then in describing the heaven as one? Or would it be more correct to speak of heavens as many or infinite in number? One, it must be determined. Termed, oh sorry, determined. One, it must be termed if it is to be framed after its pattern. For that which embraces all the in all intelligible living creatures could never be second with another beside it. For if so, there must needs exist yet another living creature which should embrace them both and of which they too would each be a part, in which case this universe could no longer be rightly described as modeled on these two, but rather on that third creature which contains them both. Wherefore, in order that this creature might resemble the all-perfect living creature in respect of its uniqueness, for this reason its maker made neither two universes nor an infinite number. But there is and will continue to be this one generated heaven, unique of its kind. Now that which has... Hey, remember now. That's an argument that's going both ways, not just the universe, but also this. Right. You're saying they're both, hey, one, one. Good. Um, now, that which has come into existence must needs be a bodily form, visible and tangible. Yet without fire, nothing could ever become visible, nor tangible without some solidity, nor solid without earth. Hence, in beginning to construct the body of the all, God was making it of fire and earth. But it is not possible that two, that two things alone should be conjoined without a third, for there must needs be some intermediary bond to connect the two. And the most beautiful of bonds is that which most perfectly unites into one both itself and the thing which it, things which it binds together. And to effect this in the most beautiful manner is the natural property of analogy. <coughs> For whenever the middle term of any three numbers, cubic or square, is such as the first term is to it, so is it to the last term. And again, conversely, as the last term is to the middle, so is the middle to the first. Then the middle term becomes in turn the first and the last, while the first and the last become in turn middle terms. 
and the necessary consequences will be all will be that all the terms are interchangeable and being interchangeable they all form a unity <coughs> now if the body of the all had had to come into existence as a plain surface having okay that's not okay okay um, notice all of this deals with just one side not the other and therefore it's an inferior work and we can drop this whole idea Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> now you gotta go back that way now. Right? Nope. You're supposed to agree with the instructor or your name will be sent to, to Hades who will await your arrival. Okay, would you agree? All of this stuff that she just read, I'll put it in the living, intelligible creature. Look, I put it all here, see? saves me from writing it. And there's no parallel over here, so that it's hot air, and this idea that you can find a parallel between the two falls on his face. I'm sure glad of that, because I thought maybe it'd be work. Well, the model, the model copy with the soul in between is the mean term. Uh, that's what I thought. But if everything is in the copy and not in the model, and one is supposed to resemble the other, it doesn't. Yeah, but the very generation of the copy. I from... don't mind if it generates it, but it doesn't resemble it, does it? I know what yes, to do. It does. I can ask. Because it ends up that because of the way that it is generated through analogy, so they all form a unity. So what? So it does end up being a form of oneness. Okay. This okay. whole thing ends up being a unity, and therefore it's a close resemblance. Okay? That's it. Okay. No. I'll take that. All right, we can go on. No. There is a likeness. Sway when you agree. <laughs> sure, would you mind elbowing her? <coughs> right, right, right. Is the promise that there is a definite, not just resemblance, but most resembles? Well, does it? Yeah, the mean term is perfectly uniting these two extreme terms. Sure. It says that the mean term here is perfectly uniting these two extreme terms. Therefore, there's a likeness between the two. Oh. Um. oh would you agree there's a whole bunch of stuff in here that we was just described? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it perfectly resembles what this is? And is united to it. Well, it's even more than that. It unites into one. So okay, I'll put it here. Like unity unites into one. I'll put it both there. No, okay. not you. Okay, not that makes it very close resemblance. Okay. No. Yeah, yeah, I got it. It All unites. The terms are interchangeable. Okay, oh, you want me to? Well, yeah, but it unites into one is not. Okay, I'll put that over here. Okay. Well, that's what it, that, but in the paragraph before, but there is and will continue to be this one generated hey, look heaven. Here, look here. I'm sorry. Now look here. You're not staying, you're not staying with the text. Are there a bunch of things mentioned? Yes or no? In this yes. Right. In what way can we say it closely resembles it? Does he then not only state those things, but also expresses them in terms of an analogy? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't see any tie over here with that. Look, I'll go along with you. Let's keep reading. I've got another paragraph. Then. Fair enough? No. That's, that's, okay. Now, if the body of the all... No, no, no. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought you wanted to... <coughs> The question is whether or not the author intended clearly 
to make a very strong statement about the way in which two things are being compared. And if he says it most resembles it, then you would expect to find some basis for saying it most resembles it. Agree? Do you find it? Yes or no? That's all. Not yet. Hi. Here it says that all the terms are interchangeable. Well, at least some principle ought to be there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's go on then. I, I don't mind. I, I, uh, I bought the text and I might as well use it. Well, now if the body of the all had had to come into existence... Why are you reading? Oh, I thought you said go on. Oh, oh excuse me. I thought you were going back on this point. Okay, everyone ready to go back then? No. <laughs> What's the matter with you? Shouldn't you agree with Regina and I? Regina's <laughs> funny. Uh, no, I'm not ready. I, I'm still puzzling on your question. Would you agree there's a whole bunch of stuff and then he orders them in terms of an analogy and all of that? How is it related to the other side? On what basis can you make that claim? Well, he's done that yet. Stop. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, wouldn't, wouldn't the paradigm have to uh, reflect the principle? I would expect it, but on what basis can you make that claim? Well, well, the that which is generated, right, has all these uh, attributes of a mean analogy. Therefore, the paradigm would necessarily have to have those principles, right, inherent in it. I would like to agree with you. On what basis can you say that, since the uh, intelligible living creature is a one? Right. So, but what I think, well, what I was trying to point out is that, right, this is all generated from that, correct? Oh, I go for logic, yeah. No, okay. In terms of logic, he's right. They will go on then. Barbara's point was that if we can't solve that, Proclus's 148 should be tossed out. <clears throat> Agree, Barbara? Uh, you know, I, I've kind of forgotten the reasoning upon which I, I made that point. Uh, could you, uh, didn't we, didn't you lead me to that conclusion? Uh, Every divine order has an internal unity. Right? A threefold origin. From its highest, its mean, and its last one. Right. Mm -hmm. So, it's not, see, it's one. How can we make that? Okay, all right, we, we, we keep reading it. Well, Maybe he'll come to it later and then we'll be surprised. But he says it cannot be two because it is from only the one. It cannot be a duplicate, otherwise it'd be two that would make two models now. So there are four models instead I'm of four. two. See? That's See? what he's saying. He's on my side. So where do we, fig where do we figure from there? Because it stops at that point. I don't see anything else. And Proposition 13 is at stake. Okay. Well, in 148, it states that it's, right, that the first term is independent of it mm -hmm. and naturally uh, communicating its order or its unity, I'm sorry. Right? Okay, let's push the next part, all right? We'll get some more, all right? We'll get some more interesting puzzles. Okay, go ahead. Um, okay. So now, if the body of the all had had to come into existence as a plain surface, having no depth, one middle term would have sufficed to bind together both itself and its fellow terms. But now it is otherwise, for if it for it behooved it 
to be solid of shape. And what brings solids into unison is never one middle term alone, but always two. Thus it was that in the myths between fire and earth, God set water and air. And having bestowed upon them so far as possible a like ratio, one towards another, air being to water as fire to air, and water being to earth as air to water. He joined together and constructed a heaven visible and tangible. For these reasons, and out of these materials such in kind and four in number, the body of the cosmos was harmonized by analogy and brought into existence. These conditions secured for it amity, so that being unified in identity with itself, it became indissoluble <clears throat> by any agent other than him who had bound it together. here. Uh, the first one is a uh, mean analogy of three terms, and then he then makes room for the fourth. Huh? Well then, uh, what shall we do over here? I mean, if it, it most closely resembles it, Shouldn't there be something over here that resembles that? Or, oh, let's skip it. It's okay with me because I don't want to work if I don't have to. Well, there should be an analogy, too, but we don't know what the terms are. Mm. That's right. So. Two or one? There should be a mean and a four-term analogy. Then you say it should be parallels for both? Let's say yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, if you say yes, then we can have fun. All right. I say no in the text. No. Three yes, four no. Hmm. Then he must be making a distinction between the third and the fourth, which you cannot relate or refer to. What is this? Idea of the mind of God. Paradigm. Intelligible living creatures. One. So look here. Suppose yes for this, no for this. Okay. If it is exactly the same, it is not a resemblance, it's an equality. There has to be a difference. Yeah, but the difference could lie, the difference could lie in the terms, not that one analogy holds and one doesn't. You're right. probably right. But that, why do you say that the fourth term is not? The fourth, you wouldn't put the fourth one in there? No, well, well why do you say no? Oh, I just wanted to get people upset. <laughs> or maybe there's a good reason there. Well, the three things he's bringing in is, is uh, you know, a deviation from the mean, which is either to the left and to the right of it, and they, they relate by correspondence. So it, that, I mean, this is what he's stating in the book. You have, you have a central, and the, from the beginning to the center is one, and from the center to the other, from the end mm -hmm. is another. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have a correspondence of three means. Yeah. A to B, B to C. See, that's good reason. A to B, B to C, like we did last that's week. Good reason. But suppose that's I already said, um, I think he text. makes the distinction in the text. We don't have to do any reasoning whatsoever. That would be a heck of a lot easier. Wouldn't it? Let me check. There, see? Two votes. 
little crazy. How about you? Perhaps a little tougher, because then you have to find it in the text. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Say, what is the distinction he makes, why he needs the fourth and leaves the three? Why does he leave the meaningology and requires four terms? Because now it's a solid. Because? Because he says now it's a solid. It's solid of shape. And that requires two mean terms, not one. Oh, okay, okay. Got it? Come on, everyone got to quote them? Would that do it? Look, anyone gives an answer. How do you know that's a good answer? Should you go along with it? You say, yeah, that's it. Now, I'd like you to do that whenever I say something. <laughs> and I get confidence in my own answer. Yeah, I think uh, I could back up what Nabuya said. What? 32B3. Yeah. I'd also add, he's focusing on the relationship between the terms. So if there's two extremes, like in a mean analogy, then only one middle term suffices to bind together. See, if we have his conclusion, why does he want the uh, mean analogy? The consequences... <clears throat> All the terms are interchangeable, and being interchangeable, they all form a unity. So it's not just a unity. The very nature of it are interchangeable, agree? Yeah. They all form a unity. Okay, try about the next sentence. Now, if the body of the all had had to come into existence as a plain figure, having no depth, one middle term would have sufficed. Therefore, what? If you want a plain figure, physical universe, you, you need can. four terms. Mm -hmm. Oh, Depth. is this a physical universe? No. 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 Therefore, you don't need four terms. You don't need four terms. But now, can you tell me why you should leave this in? <laughs> What's the this here? I mean, I can, Sir, this? The, the mean analogy? Pardon? Uh, I'm sorry, I was just asking. But uh, Marty said that when you said we should, why we should leave this in, you referring to the fact that on the side of the intelligible there was the three terms? Analogy, the mean term? Okay. So, um, is it one? Oh, is this one? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a one of what? Many, is it not? Mm -hmm. Brought together into harmony by these analogies? Mm -hmm. So it's not a pure one by any means, right? What is it? Oh, it's yeah. a whole. Mm -hmm. Right, it's a whole. Oh, how about this? This is a one. What kind of a one? Plural. It's a one many, isn't it? So it's oh, one many, one of a whole. One many. Oh, now let's go by. Why does he like the three terminology, the mean analogy? And the most beautiful of bonds, see, he doesn't say the most beautiful bonds for this cosmos. It's in general, isn't it? Right? <clears throat> Therefore, would you not agree? It still could be a one. And therefore, we need to look for what would represent each of the three terms. 
and can they be related to one another in terms of a mean analogy? Agree? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's a goof. Ah, so then we have to keep our eye open for that. Is that correct? Is that where you'd reason? Ah, okay. If so, then let's push further. Watch the idea of whole. <clears throat> now, of the four elements, the construction of the cosmos had taken up the whole of every one. Right. Watch the word whole as we go on. For its constructor had constructed it of all the fire and water and air and earth that existed, leaving over outside it, leaving over outside it, no single particle or potency of any one of these elements. And these were his intentions. First, that it might be, so far as possible, a living creature, perfect and whole, with all its parts perfect. And next, that it might be one, inasmuch as there was nothing left over out of which another like creature might come into existence. And further, that it might be secure from age and ailment, since he perceived that when heat and cold and all things which have violent potency surround a composite body from without and collide with it, they dissolve it unduly and make it to waste away by bringing upon it ailments and age. Wherefore, because of this reasoning, he fashioned it to be one single whole, compounded of all wholes, perfect and ageless and unailing. And he bestowed on it the shape which was befitting and akin. Now for that living creature, which is designed to embrace within itself all living creatures, the fitting shape will be that which comprises within itself all the shapes there are. Wherefore he wrought it into a round in the shape of a sphere, equidistant in, in all directions from the center to the extremities, which of all shapes is the most perfect and the most self-similar. Since he deemed that the similar, since he deemed that the similar, self-similar, since he deemed that the similar, oh, since he deemed that the similar is infinitely more beautiful than the dissimilar. And on the outside, round, about, it was all made smooth with great exactness, and that for many, and that for many reasons. <coughs> for of eyes, it had no need, since outside of it there was nothing visible left over, nor yet of hearing, since neither was there anything audible, nor was there any air surrounding it which called for respiration. Nor again did it need any organ whereby it might receive the food that entered and evacuate what remained undigested. For nothing went out from it or came into it from any side, since nothing existed. For it was so designed as to supply its own wastage as food for itself, and to experience by its own agency and within itself all actions and passions. <coughs> since he that had constructed it deemed that it would be better if it were self-sufficing rather than in need of other things. Hands, too, he thought, he ought not to attach unto it uselessly, seeing they were not required either for grasping or for repelling anyone, nor yet feet, nor any instruments of locomotion whatsoever. Okay. All right. Can you do it now? Huh? Interesting. Got all Preacher. of that? Now can you find parallels? What? <sighs> Therefore, this must be, if this is a whole of all holes, what? Of each of the part, if each of the terms, each one must be, each of the three must be so beautifully intertwined 
has to be a triad. Okay? Must be perfect, whole. Right? Must be nothing other than that. Right? Ah, come on. Look at this statement. If this is true, the statement he made, the similar is infinitely more beautiful than the dissimilar. And if we're talking about the similar and the... Um, which one would be dissimilar to whatever degree? The cosmos. Mm -hmm. Therefore, proportionately, this must be... Infinitely more beautiful. Infinitely more beautiful. Astonishingly beautiful. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. Now look here. Can you just take all of the qualities that he spun out of the cosmos? See, it's circular. Huh? Ageless, unailing. Now, go to the conclusions. Look here. Don't tell me about whether he has ears, nose, throat, hands, feet. Tell me what state of mind it results in if it does not have these things. That quality we can then assign to the living creature. This is a state of mind. Hey, this is a state of mind, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Hey, it's perfect. There's nothing left over. Right means what? Lacks nothing. Lacks nothing needs Lacks nothing. nothing. Nothing external from it. Hey, hearing. Equidistant in all directions. It did not need, go to the conclusion, it didn't need any organ. Why? <clears throat> nothing external. For nothing went out from it or... See all the actions? No no motion, right? Nothing impinging upon it from the outside, right? Therefore, there's no boundary. Look, how about hands? Being in that state, there is no grasping. Hey, come on. Can you do that? Can you take all of these qualities and assign them over here? Therefore, in that state, there's no grasping. Oh, more. Come on, do it. Assign them. For nothing went out from it or came into it from any side since nothing existed. Now, this whole thing, right, is a preparation for the next sentence. Okay, so we can go back and do that. What are we saying? as he constructs this cosmos, makes it a whole, and all the qualities he gives to it are in the extreme in this idea, in the mind of God, or reality itself. Okay. So what? What do you get for it? The next sentence? Go ahead. Um, for... Oh. For movement, he assigned unto it that which is proper to its body, namely that one of the seven motions, which especially assigned. that one of that one of the seven motions, which specially belongs to reason and intelligence. Oh, is that what we were looking for? Oh. Hmm. Oh, I see. Okay. I didn't read it right. You want to read it again then? Yeah, for movement he assigned unto it that which is proper to its body, namely that one of the seven motions, which specially belongs to reason and intelligence. Whereas he spun it round uniformly in the same spot within itself and made it move revolving in a circle. Yep. Do you want me to continue? No. Okay. No, just for a few minutes.
Now, if you keep that in mind, that sentence, uh, we're going to go back to it several times. He's going to build on it. Because this kind of motion of the whole, of the whole cosmos, you know what, it especially belongs to uh, yeah, reason and intelligence. I guess that's uh, phrenesis, isn't it? Intellect. And we want to know how noose and phrenesis relates in this work, and there's the big part. Right? Hmm. So there's a special kind of motion that relates to noose and phrenesis. It's on one spot, uniformly, mm -hmm. within itself, <laughs> and made to move everything in a circle. Can you visualize that? What kind of a, if you had to do that, what would you be doing? Usia. Usia. It goes out. That's Usia. Yeah. That's right. That's Usia. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. That's the proper motion of the mind. Mind turning upon itself in one spot, some one spot turns upon itself, knows itself. Mm. Right? So he said, hey, that whole thing has that quality, therefore put it over here, and we're talking about the nature of that idea in the mind of God. What does it do? <whistles> oh, wow, that's interesting. Some one spot turns upon itself, sees itself, knows itself. <coughs> 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 Within itself, and I get more of a sphere moving like a top. Okay, yeah. I'll take it. I'll it's take it. You see like yeah, well, it's four, four dimension. Okay. <laughs> Last paragraph. He spun it round uniformly in the same spot and within itself, and made it move revolving in a circle, and all the other six motions. He took away and fashioned it free from their aberrations. And seeing that for this revolving motion it had no need of feet, he begat it legless and footless. Such then was the sum of the reasoning of the ever existing God concerning the God which was one day to be existent, whereby he made it smooth and even and equal on all sides from the center a whole and perfect body compounded of perfect bodies. And in the midst thereof he set his soul, he set soul, which he stretched throughout the whole of it, and therewith he enveloped also the exterior of its body. And as a circle revolving in a circle, he established one soul, one soul and solitary heaven, able of itself because of its excellence to company with itself and needing none other beside, sufficing unto itself as acquaintance and friend. And because of all this, he generated it to be a blessed God. Okay, what did he do then with this? From in the midst of it, in the midst of it, right, in three dimensions, right? What did he spread out? Soul. One soul, soul in solitary heaven. Is that right? Oh, so. Huh. Well, that ought to be weird. That's the introduction to the idea of world soul. See? That's where. The whole universe, therefore, is, is, is and soul, therefore, it's a living animal. What? Just in a few sentences. So, in this, he, the the living the. Demiurgus then is exhibiting Usia as he is constructing this dialogue, this living creature. Cosmos. Would that, or cosmos, would that be I don't fair? know. You got a quote for it? No, I'm just. Should I make one up? Okay. I don't no, mind. I'm just, I'm just saying that as as he's as he's talking about what he's doing, and so we're seeing how he is coming to the reasoning of 
why he selected this particular living creature. Okay, you're saying that you're not getting a response, right? No, I yeah. just what, what, I happening? just wondered that. Just struck me that he, if we were, he's presenting a, a, a model or some paradigm as he's talking about, as he's unfolding this in his own mind, we're watching him do it. And he's presenting it as a model of how to reason. Okay. That may be the case, but you change your position from the first statement you made, which is okay with me. Okay. I don't know which one was better. I remember what? the first one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> which one's better? I don't know. I remember the first one. One of us has to remember. Didn't you add to see it to it? Oh, I forgot that part. Oh, you forgot that? Oh, that was your original point. Yeah. And I asked you, have well, you got a quote for it? I guess I have a question then. I guess I have a question. Uh, for <laughs> movement, he assigned unto it that which is proper to its body, namely that one of the seven motions which belongs, specifically belongs to reason and intelligence. Uh, and reason and intelligence is fernacious and noose. So we're, we're still, uh, I didn't understand that. What is? <coughs> Now you're now you're wondering, so I can yeah. move on. Is that right? Yeah, I just saw that I didn't understand then the relationship between Fernesis, Nus, and Usia at this point by what we had just talked about, that he's turning upon himself and No, I noticed that. So. so what part is Fernesis? Why should I tell you it's your theory? Come on. Don't ask me to No, I'm just saying what part's Fronesis? If he's if Gina. If his activity is who's Find it. Okay. What? Find what? Oh, did you understand the yeah, the third question, driven than the other two, by the way? Which I don't mind because it's a good question. No, I just wanted to know. You describe Usia at well, maybe I'm not using the right language, but he was oo-seeing, I guess. How is that different than phronesis and noose? Well, noose, okay, but phronesis. Okay. The important point is you don't give it down what I think. Right, we want to get it out of the text. <coughs> Second point, Booker. It was a suggestion that was offered, right. not from the text, but that description in terms of the way in which he's talking about the creation of the cosmos sounded very much like the idea of Lucia. Right. Okay, that's just speculation. So we didn't get out of the text no. yet because he does use that term in the next couple of paragraphs many times and we'll use it. Okay. Right? So you're taking the possibility, a theoretical point that's being raised and want to see how it differs from Nus and from Asus. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. right. right. Yeah, good. Good question. Oh, okay. But that you don't, that you would want me to just talk? I wouldn't do that. Mm. Why not? Okay. The whole thing. All right. Well, I got a good book. Yeah, I got <laughs> You're right. <clears throat> okay. Watch now. Next paragraph, one sentence. Now, as regards the soul, although we are essaying to describe it after the body, God did not likewise plan it to be younger than the body. For when uniting them, he would not have permitted the elder to be ruled by the younger. But as for us men, even as we ourselves partake largely of the accidental and casual, so also do our words. God, however, constructed soul to be older than body and prior in birth and excellence, since she... <laughs> Okay, we have a she, was to be mistress and ruler, and it the ruled. And he made her of the materials in the fashion which I shall now describe. Now the next paragraph is key. 
All right, so a lot of terms we talked about before now emerge, <clears throat> especially that good old Captain Tao, Tao Tao Tao. Right, Barbara? Right. And Usia, right? <clears throat> so, uh, can I read? Sir? Can I read? Well, I wanted to finish it. I'm grasping. No, go ahead. No, that's, <laughs> midway. No, no. Oh, okay. No, no. No, no, no. I'm going to jump in. I was going Hold to uh, finish it. But I love you, Jesus. Yeah, midway but you like to interrupt. The, no, no, wait a while. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Midway between the two. Um, what do you pull out of that paragraph that's significant that we need to continue our resemblance? <laughs> Now that he's going to push in the soul, so what? How does that fit? Or put it in another way, what virtue is added by that we can then apply to the idea in the mind of God or the paradigm. Can you do that? Can you read it, please? As the cosmos <clears throat> has been brought into existence as a one, with soul permeating the cosmos for, so too the intelligible living creature, the paradigm, <clears throat> the idea of the uh, mind of God, not only permeates all, but also functions in a similar, but higher and more profound function as the soul. Therefore, fill in this. And you got it. <clears throat> Thank you.
For for what? That's what he's asking. What do you mean for what? It's not intelligent. Fill it in. <clears throat> you should give me an answer. For Don't ask me anything. What? For the presence of reason? Ah, get in a tax, will you, for God's sakes? Hmm. <sighs> Could you give me an elbow every once in a while? Okay, thank you. Please you continue the elbows. <laughs> <laughs> As the cosmos has been brought into existence with soul permeating the cosmos for some reason, so too the intelligible living creature, sometimes called the paradigm of the mind of God, the idea in the mind of God, not only permeates all, but also functions in a similar way, but in a higher and more profound function as the soul. So, so I need to know to listen. <clears throat> yes, the word mistress. The soul is the ruler, and the cosmos is what right. it rules. Which one? For the soul, then, will be. The mistress. The, the mistress. The mistress. And the mistress and ruler. Ruler. Right. What would be higher than a mistress? Master. Yeah. Master or king. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> right. No. The language follows, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Right. Is that right? You'd go along with that? No, I got it. He would. It's over. Is that right? Parallel structures? Yes or no? Even the language and the metaphors used, mistress, right? right. Ah. So, so then we can assign that to? Ah. Mm. <clears throat> but what's, what allows you to so easily? Pardon me? How, what are the, what's your reasoning behind not assuming that there is something in the intelligible living creature that acts as its ruler? just as the soul is in the cosmos, cosmos as its ruler. And, and you jump from, there's not something in the intelligible creature, but it is. There's not something in the intelligible creature that is the ruler, but it is the ruler. It is the ruler. That's right. That would be the difference. It is the ruler. It's not merely in it, because what would be in it? That would be the ruler in the soul. Intelligible and improved. News. Intelligible. But do you reason that way because the intelligible living creature is one, therefore there can't be anything in it? Um, <coughs> let's do it together, okay? Um, intelligible living creature. Well, Fine. Yeah. What's your question on? Well, I'm trying to figure out the reasoning you went through to not make the obvious analogical jump that just as there's something in the cosmos that rules it, so too there must be something in the intelligible living creature that rules it. That's right. I mean, that's right. That's right. No, but what's the... <coughs> what's right? I, I'm trying to find out the, the reasoning that you went through, and my answer is perhaps because the intelligible living creature is right, <coughs> and therefore... It would be foolish to assume that. Whatever this. we're saying, that whatever he uses to describe this, the reasons for any of the points must equally be here in a more superlative fashion. And, and be consistent with the rest of the work. It all hangs on that opening idea that we had on the board. It's invitation. Therefore, if we can imitate all of those divine motions, we're in. But we have to know that's not enough because he's talking about two rather curious things. Noose, logo, three things. Noose, logos, and uh, phrenesis.
Okay, we quit. Good place? Wow. <clears throat> because now, uh, especially you people who know a little bit of Greek, get into it, watch the word. You see it, right? Watch it carefully. And, uh, whole, see it, being, um, and watch how same other <coughs> functions, whole, and, um, And I think you'd want to uh, see the idea of resemblance repeated again uh, rather strongly. And I don't know whether we'll get it next week, but we should get there at 37D, page 75. <clears throat> and when the father that engendered it, perceived it in motion, alive, a thing of joy to the eternal gods, he too rejoiced. And being well pleased, he designed him to make it resemble its model still more closely. Watch now, so therefore, we're going to have to follow it now. Hey, where we're going, you have to even do more work than you did tonight. Right? Even more closely than what we've been doing. And therefore, as usual, we'll expect people on the first row to do more work. Yeah, there's sliders. Okay. Okay. Fun. Thank you, guys. Fun, fun.